So the second panel discussion we have of uh, the African Mining Summit 2019 is, is very appropriately follows the, the regulatory session, and this one is on mining and finance, charting a new way forward for the African mining sector. I'm joined by two, and there will be a third panelist joining us any moment, she's just sadly stuck in traffic, uh, panelists, and on my left-hand side is, is Dr. Mike Seeger, uh, a director of MX Mining Capital Advisor, a veteran uh, mining financier, uh, and to his left is the Honourable Polite Kamambura, the Deputy Minister of Mines uh, from Zimbabwe. So in, in order to kind of kick off the panel, I'm going to give a, a few introductory remarks, and it's going to be a little bit more informal than the, the previous one, but I hope it's going to be something that you can extract some value on in terms of how we can finance both mining and exploration projects going forward. As I mentioned in my introduction, the gold price is beginning to rise, and what typically happens in commodity cycles is other commodities start to take place actually after that. China remains one of the largest uh, consumers, and the growth or not, as the case may be, it is possibly one of the highest risks. And I'm delighted that Mike has just come back from China, literally two or three days ago, and he is very happy to share his insights in terms of uh, China itself uh, and what China can offer in terms of our mining environment. However, saying that, that the commodity prices are rising, exploration expenditure is still at a low level. And we all know that exploration can take up to 10 years or more to actually deliver a mine. So probably those deposits which have yet to be discovered may miss out on this commodity boom. And then final comment I'd like to make, and then we'll start to kind of get into the discussion, is funding for pre-feasibility study projects remains very difficult. If you have a feasibility study on the back of an indicated or measured resource, funding is difficult, uh, but it isn't a patch on trying to raise money for exploration work, particularly grassroots exploration work. So the, the, the few questions I'd like to address to the panel, I'm going to say them up front, uh, out of respect for the panel, so there can be some kind of uh, preparation. Uh, and there will be some specific questions for uh, specific members. Uh, but some of the general questions I'm going to ask uh, are firstly, how can juniors and majors embrace the commodity uptake? How can they latch onto it? Because typically, as we know, is that most people start spending money on exploration now, and when the mine goes into production, it's at the bottom end of the cycle, and they end up not delivering the mine or selling it. You know, how can we learn the lessons of history, uh, which is so important? The second question, uh, which I'll ask the panelists, are sources of funds. Uh, where can explorers and developers uh, raise their money, uh, whether it be debt, equity, or elsewhere? And uh, Aleba Heng, I'm sure, uh, will develop on elsewhere when she gets here. What kind of government incentives are there to actually stimulate exploration or, or mine development in your country? Uh, and here I'll use the example of the Canadian flow-through share scheme. One of the reasons why the Canadian exploration industry is uh, so vibrant compared to anywhere else is they have the flow-through share scheme. Uh, and the question, of course, is why don't other countries, particularly in Africa, uh, have that? And then finally, what collaboration opportunities are there available, whether it be between mining companies, uh, miners and suppliers, uh, and indeed probably one of the best collaboration uh, ventures in the world, that between the government of uh, Botswana and, and De Beers itself. And then for Mike, I've got a couple of specific questions. Uh, he, he will talk to us about some recent mining transactions as case studies. So this is not theory, this is reality, uh, and I'm sure that will be uh, of great benefit to all of us. He will also tell us about what works and what doesn't work, and, and I think that will elicit some uh, good Q&A from, from the floor. And, and as I mentioned in my introduction, he's just come back from China. And as China is one of the, the largest consumers of commodities in the world, and as many investment bankers see uh, China as being the biggest risk in terms of commodity uh, price growth, I think that's going to be particularly interesting for all of us. And then obviously the questions I'm going to ask the Honourable Minister will be more around 
uh, stimulating investment in, in that particular country. But firstly, uh, let me hand over to Mike, and uh, if, if you could kind of kick off and talk to us a little bit about recent mining transactions. Thank you, James. Good, um, so I'm gonna give you a, a sort of a summary of, of recent transactions in, in different commodities. And um, I'm going to not talk about names, but just give you the, the because uh, most of them are bound by confidentiality, but I'll give you the same in terms of, of these transactions. So I'll start with the coal sector. Uh, the coal sector is, is close to my heart. Uh, we're not popular. I've been involved in many coal mining ventures. And um, I will tell you how we, we are managing to finance coal projects. So the first uh, transaction is a, is a feasibility study having been completed. It's a, uh, it's a project that is uh, in a, about to be licensed. It's, uh, it's going to deliver coal to the regional African market. And this uh, project has all the tick boxes, uh, almost, I would say, 95% complete. And what we have here is a, is a debt facility. A uh, debt facility by a private equity fund, meaning the money has to be repaid. There's uh, an interest payable. Um, there's, a, there's a tax break. There's a, there's a, um, there's a, uh, a payment holiday. And the whole term of this transaction is 10 years. So this is, I would say, a bit of an extraordinary financing of a coal project. What is much more popular are, I think, at this point in time, strategic partnerships and offtake agreements. So a strategic partnership a transaction that we um, are involved in is a smaller coal project. It's been explored by the junior mining company, and the mining company uh, what, what have we done? We've secured a strategic partner. And the strategic partner is a mid-tier company, and this mid-tier company has the cash, the capital, to develop this asset, and this transaction involved a upfront cash payment as well as a royalty. It's all about the valuation of this of the asset, but these are the type of coal transactions that are, are possible in this environment of, of coal not being attractive. Moving on to gold. Gold is much more or much easier financeable, especially if, it's, if the project is advanced. So at an advanced stage, uh, if it's licensed, if there's a horizon to produce soon, you've got streaming, uh, streaming opportunities whereby a streamer, meaning a fund, puts capital up front in lieu of uh, getting gold at a discount uh, for an extended period until the loan is repaid. Um, at the same time, in Africa, uh, we find that uh, DFIs, development finance institutions, like to play in that space. On the exploration side, uh, what we have is one transaction whereby it was an exploration project uh, with a prospect of more than a million ounces. And again, in, in line with the theme, a strategic partnership, it's a farming agreement whereby a listed company takes a position in the junior and the listed company, uh, the, the junior is vended into the listed company and the listed company takes on the obligation to pay for exploration and the feasibility study. In the metal space, um, we've been involved in a transaction that's involved a titanium vanadium project and it involved a very costly financing facility, um, $25 million uh, at a very high interest rate of plus 12%, and a 25% profit share for the financier until the loan is repaid. So um, these are the kind of uh, scenarios that you expect in the metal space, and there's always an angle to it, it's the right to the product. And in the diamond space, um, we've looked at a transaction whereby the, the owner uh, um, was uh, happy to involve, be involved as the following transaction. It's a contractor vendor financed uh, solution whereby the contractor gets the rights to mine, process, 
and market the diamond and pay the owner a royalty. So, James, you find it's all about bespoke solutions fit for the mining business case. Great, Mike, thank you very much indeed. And just as a matter of disclosure, uh, the last transaction which Mike referred to uh, is a transaction between Mike's group and my group, uh, which we an announced at uh, 8 o'clock Botswana time this morning, and our share price is already 10% up. So I'm delighted. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Go to the, the Honourable Minister. Uh, in, in your view, Hon Honourable Minister, what can the mining industry do about political risks, uh, both at, at the local level and at the global level? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Uh, that mining companies or project developers work in to growth with governments, uh, right straight from project uh, development to implementation. Uh, and also lobby for consistent policies through the uh, life of the project right from economic feasibility studies to um, exploration, development, production, and the marketing. Uh, to try and mitigate uh, the political risks, like I've said, there is a need to speak with one voice uh, for investors and government, and also investors should not abuse uh, the market power uh, to try and uh, uh, overlook government initiatives. Uh, national governments are not the only source of political risk in the mining project, but also some of those risks they came from uh, uh, local governments, international NGOs, community groups, local competitors and uh, other interested partners. In a way to work hand in hand with government, uh, there's a need to consider the communities in which uh, projects will be developed so that uh, the community leadership and the investor can speak with one voice. Things like employment of uh, locals, um, corporate social responsibilities or community share ownership trusts that are people-centered, that are I mean, the projects that come from the people who go a long way in mitigating political risks. The regular engagement with the community also plays an important part uh, uh, like uh, regular meetings of, on, on, on feedback Remember the challenges that the mine company is facing just to be communicated to just to be communicated to the locals, with the government playing a facilitator role or a regulator role. This uh, will avoid an, an outright uh, nationalisation by governments. In most African countries, government tend to to uh, nationalise resources. But when project developers work in the end with government and government know their part uh, in project implementation, we tend to make get much uh, uh, of this political risk. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Polite, and welcome, Alebake. Lovely to see you here. Uh, and I think that leads very, very nicely into uh, something uh, Alebake is particularly interested in, and is that is, can there be an alternative argument for resource nationalisation? This is not a wonderful. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much. My sincerest apologies for being late. I think that um, that pivots beautifully into a, an alternative argument for nationalization. Every single time we discuss nationalization, 
Our departure point is having the government take away mines from mining companies. Why not pivot that and say government invest into mines? Because then that gives us three things that I think are absolutely crucial. Additional capital for those mining companies, control over the creation of upstream linkages and control over the creation of downstream linkages because now the government has a vested interest in the beneficiation of the mineral that it's extracting. For me, I think that um, to a very large extent, when we look at nationalization from the, the, the rather perverted view that it has been looked upon in previous years, we miss the, the important aspect of how nationalization can actually change an economy. I mean, a typical case study is where we are right now, Botswana. The partnership between De Beers and Botswana is in fact nationalization and it has catalyzed the, the, the diamond industry or it has improved the diamond industry in Botswana exponentially. You look at other case studies, for example, uh, we have uh, Petrobras in Brazil, where the Brazilian government actually owns Petrobras. Petrobras is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. What they are now able to do is to control how they create the linkages. They are able to create the consumption linkages, the production linkages, simply by taking a full, or, or should I say, simply by taking responsibility for that investment and not simply taking it back as it were. So I think that when we look at nationalization, we need to open up our minds and see exactly how it is that we can use it to the benefit of both. Because mining is all about shared value. And if we can find the catalyst to that shared value, I think that nationalization is a wonderful discussion to start having in that. Lever Peng, thank you very much. Mike, uh, in your experience, uh, can this work? Uh, and if it doesn't, what, what do you think can work? Indeed, I'm a... I'm a believer that this can work. And uh, government participating right in the Botswana case in, in projects, in larger projects, and in taking an investment angle into it can only but assist the project. And why is this so important? Um, if you unpack the mining business case, where can government play a vital role? It's in terms of um, logistics, the logistics pass, the evacuation of commodities to the market. Um, ensuring that the labor force uh, that is going to work on the mine uh, is probably attuned to the mine, that community relationships are upheld. So I believe absolutely I stand uh, to support it. Thanks. Great. Uh, polite. Uh, Oliver King has offered a challenge there, uh, particularly as you're evolving your mining legislation in, in Zimbabwe. Uh, and as you mentioned at the beginning, that. Uh, Diamonds will still retain a, a majority ownership by the state. Uh, is that a funded ownership, or how is that going to work? If you could just kind of develop on uh, Mike and Oleberheng's kind of theme there about an alternative model uh, for resource nationalization. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, I wanted to put that question to Mike. <laughs> uh, Sorry, the panel's not going to be easy. <laughs> Where uh, the worst country or the country with the resource doesn't have any capital but wants to enter into a JV using the resource, is it possible that they can evaluate the resource? Say maybe uh, the, I mean, the undeveloped resources with like uh, 500 million or so. And use that, I mean, it, it, it's a leverage to enter into a JV. In fact, we, we've, been, we've been looking at a project specifically in Zimbabwe, and I'm going to relate to a coal project <laughs> with coking coal in the north and thermal coal in the north and evacuating the coal to the market and the government of Zimbabwe not having money to finance uh, or participate in financing this project. So we can, the government, participate I believe in cost-effective logistics, for example, uh, rail rates that are that uh, that that come in at a discount. Um, working together with the mine developer to apply for World Bank financing um, in in order to fund infrastructure requirements. So collaboration with the mining company 
and development finance institutions. And ensure, ensuring that the mining cap company has a longer life, a business case that warrants repayment of that development finance. So, um, yes, the, there's ways to, it's all about collaboration. And it can also be with the private sector, not necessarily de development finance institutions. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes, you can. I'm delighted this is free flight. Keep going, it's wonderful when it's set. Yes, then at the back, you can check it straight up. Okay, uh, you, Chair. Um, in that case, is a, um, a free care over an option? <laughs> Absolutely, you want to, you, you would want, the, if the government signs as a guarantor of the loan, uh, it comes with a, a, a participation in the project. And when the loan is repaid, um, project developers want government participation. They obviously uh, do not want to, you know, investors want to have at least 51% of the asset so that they have a controlling stake in it, but they want um, and, and, and can give direction to the asset, but they want government participation. It's the social license for for the asset, for the mine, for the mine life, guaranteeing that this mine life, that this mine can produce an incumbent for its life. Well, okay. yes. So where I was going to chime in is to say, I see things, I see straight lines through things. And as uh, Dr. Seeger was saying, government is a backer of loans. And in that instance, government has bonds. Government bonds can be utilized to fund mining projects. Um, look at the, essentially how, how finance will flow, right? You have the essentially the, the, the project originator, and then you have the bank. That government, or should I say, the, the, the financier would then say to the uh, project originator, um, okay, uh, what guarantee do you have? And then the project financier would say, I have a government-backed bond. Those are called commodity bonds. Commodity bonds are essentially where government utilizes its own balance sheet to procure funding such that it can be used to develop a variety of projects. Um, there's a pilot of this particular model that operates out of Japan, where the Japanese government has actually given another government money to develop mining projects, provided that those mining projects essentially collaborate with Japanese companies to bring about the mines. So when you don't look at it strictly from the case studies perspective, you can actually see that when a government leverages its own balance sheet to say, we are now going to sell commodity bonds. These bonds, we will, we will utilize that fund, those funds specifically to invest in our mining sector, where we will be a major shareholder, not a majority shareholder, but a major shareholder. And those fiscal linkages will then come back to the government and be able to repay those commodity bonds. It's a very straight line. All it needs, I think, is about two pieces of legislation. One outlining exactly what the commodity bond would look like, and the other outlining what the drawdown would be, and essentially what the repayment terms would look like, and how it would link back to the fiscus. Um, I think that when, when, when we think of mining finance, we always think that you need to have the cash on hand. But as a government, you've already got your own balance sheet. You've already got a system within which your own finances flow. And to be able to utilize that to then raise funds on the global market and utilize those funds specifically then for to develop mining projects. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful source of mining finance, in fact, because it integrates the market and it also provides that, gap, that government guarantee to say that this is a commodity bond, which means it's backed by the government, which means we can release the liquidity to the project and simultaneously make our fiscal linkages back into the business. Thank you, Elena King. I'd just like to add two comments and then kind of shift the debate a little bit uh, on the Honourable Minister's statement. I think that the first one is that I, I don't think there's much of a problem on companies owning 51% uh, of, uh, of mineral projects as long as their shareholder loans get paid off first. I think that's the important part because obviously the, the raising of capital does require uh, the repayment to those people. And the second comment will lead into the question I want to ask the panelists is that when you're starting on a brand new project you actually don't know what the value is when you're in exploration. 
You actually only know what the value is uh, once you get to a feasibility study and you've spent a vast amount of money. And just to give you some kind of uh, idea in terms of uh, share uplift, uh, one of my previous companies was, was African Diamonds, uh, which developed firstly alongside De Beers and then alongside Lucara, the Kuroi mine. African Diamonds shareholders received a 25 times return on their equity investment. Uh, but the investment subsequent to mining, and it's been an absolutely fabulous mine, it is nowhere near that. So it's risk money. Equally, uh, you could have lost 25 times your money, if you, if you see what I mean. That you could be a member of what my chairman calls the 1% club, which means you listed at a pound and you're now worth 1p, uh, because exploration is a risky game. Now I want to kind of uh, develop into that a little bit, uh, and, and I'll start off with you, Mike, here, and then kind of move along, is that yes, we, 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 we understand where one can raise money once you get to bankable feasibility, and, and uh, we, we can talk about royalty streaming, which we spoke about so far, uh, but what opportunities are there in your view uh, for junior explorers, uh, which will be the future here in Botswana and, and certainly elsewhere, uh, to raise money to actually do that uh, grassroots exploration work and then develop the deposit through the resource life cycle? James, there's two, two routes. It's strategic partnerships and it's uh, reverse listing, vending into an existing listed company. These would be the most obvious routes for early stage exploration projects uh, to finance uh, this, this particular stage of project. What it needs is that the developer has to be willing to shed equity. And in the, the overall mission must be, let me get this project going, as opposed to let me retain the biggest stake in the project. If you, you have to change that mindset, if you're willing to, if you put the project first and are willing to dilute, and you have an attractive uh, exploration story to tell, there are companies, um, for example, on the Australian Stock Exchange, that are willing, able, uh, and uh, with money, ready to invest in exploration projects. The other source of finance would be strategic partnerships, and that would be the junior identifying a mid-tier or larger mining company as a partner, and that would be a larger company that would be active in the area or in the host country, and the developer then actively promoting his or her project to this major mining company, and uh, um, offering a stake in lieu of financing the exploration. That would be sort of the, the first, the first to go opportunity for me. Thank you, Mike. I, think I know you've got some very interesting ideas here, uh, particularly around uh, alternative options for, uh, for juniors and, and modern ways, should I say, uh, of embracing the fourth industrial revolution of raising money. Please, could you kind of elaborate uh, and build on Mike's comments? Okay, so I absolutely agree with um, Dr. Cedar in that um, partnerships are everything because nine times out of ten, your partnerships are going to be essentially where the funding you need comes from 100%. Because your partners are going to be the, the, the mining, or not even the mining companies, the, the, the contractors that come with you down the line. Um, it's going to be your buyers that are going to come down with you on that line. And I mean, that goes into the other alternative source of funding, which is streaming agreements, to sell your material outright before it comes out and say to your buyer, look, we will offer you our product at said rate, discounted, you give us the cash up front so that we can develop the project. That injects a huge amount of liquidity into your project and you're also able to pace yourself because your buyer has already said, I have bought this amount of product, deliver this to me over a set, uh, period of time. Um, obviously, it's, 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 it's mining method dependent, depending on, on, on what mining method you're going to be employing, but I think that it's actually a very good, um, it's a very good option. Uh, so what James is referring to is actually what uh, SMF does, which is using blockchain applications and crowdfunding to finance mining projects. Because it's <coughs> risk money, and it's money that a lot of people honestly cannot afford to lose in those large volumes, we changed it and we said, okay, if you feel you cannot offer us 10 million upfront, offer us a thousand. 
And we'll see what we do with that when we put a lot of investors together. Because it's risk funding, we want people to be able to lose without losing faith in the project. Um, <laughs> James's, uh, James's chairman, uh, Mr. Teeling, always says, as a junior miner, I'm going to ask you for your money, I'm going to take it, and it's unlikely I will bring it back. Because that's what exploration is. It's about, it's about diving in the dark and not being able to see essentially what's going to come out of it. But what's wonderful about utilizing crowdfunding is that it's not necessarily money that people are going to cry for in the long run. So you're able to make it a lot more nimble, you're able to spread it nice and thin, and you're able to attract a lot of investors because they know they don't have to commit on in the long term for, for too much money. They can commit for a short period of time with a little bit of money, and that money will be able to go far. In terms of the blockchain technology, actually this year we've had a lot of developments in the blockchain space as to how we operate. So um, essentially, I'm sure some of you have heard about block, uh, what's it, uh, Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin technology is blockchain technology, but we don't use Bitcoin. We use a concept called an initial coin offering. So essentially, you tie the value of the project to a coin, a virtual coin rather. And the investor is essentially buying uh, coins. He's essentially buying the project through those virtual <coughs> coins. And that those coins reflect a virtual value. That virtual value is determined by essentially the amount of work you've put into the project. So you will attach to that coin, you will attach uh, the cost of drilling, you will attach the offtake agreements. So all that information essentially comes together and correlates for you uh, a tangible NPV that you can say to the investor, this project is currently worth said amount based on the amount of work we've done. Most times, as you develop the project further, it moves further up the value chain, which gives the coin even an even larger value. Obviously, it's exploration, so sometimes the value of the coin actually goes down because you might find that uh, the deposit has lost value or it's no longer economically saleable. But the wonderful thing about blockchain is that it gives the investor a real-time valuation of the project within which he is invested so that he knows exactly how much he is into you for and how much he's going to get out of it once he decides to execute his exit plan. So I think that's, that's a nice way that we're sort of dipping our toes into the fourth industrial revolution and also um, when you mix crowdfunding and the concept of the blockchain application, what you get is a beautiful marriage of both knowledge and, 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 and consistency. Unfortunately, investing in mines is, is a black box investment. You just have to trust. You just have to say, okay, we're going into this exploration. We think there's a diamond pipe here and you go along with it. But when we're able to update you on a daily basis, of what's going on with your particular coin offering and your particular coin value, there's a lot more confidence that the investor has because they know exactly in which direction their money is moving on that particular day. Eleven Kane, thank you very much. I'm going to ask two more questions. Uh, and if the, the ladies and gentlemen with the mics could kind of start roving around. And as before, I'll take three questions at a time. Uh, the, the questions here for the Honourable Minister and, and Mike. Honourable Minister, to build on what Oliver Kane and, and, and Mike have been talking about in terms of raising funds, uh, one of the most successful ways a, a government can actually help stimulate early stage exploration uh, is around tax incentives because it's high risk funding. Uh, I'll, I'll give an example of the Canadian flow through share scheme, which has not been very successfully duplicated anywhere else around the world. It's such a case that if you put $10,000, for example, into a, a Canadian junior, doesn't matter where it's operating around the world, as long as it's listed in, in, in Canada, you will get a, a, a tax rebate at your full marginal rate. Uh, and it's not just in, in mining, it's across many, many other industries. In South Africa, they had the, the 12J uh, taxation incentive, but sadly, it isn't working. Uh, and I don't think it's funded one single mining project. Uh, and it's funding retail stores and franchises and things. So it's just got too complicated. It's a very simple thing. Would uh, Zimbabwe, uh, and I, this is probably more of a Minister of Finance question than, than yours, but I'm gonna put you a little bit on the spot here. Would Zimbabwe 
contemplate something like that where citizens of Zimbabwe could invest in exploration projects in their country, in Zimbabwe, where uh, they will get a, a, a full rebate at their top marginal rate. Uh, okay, um, as I said before, the government is in the process of uh, implementing several reforms in the sector. And uh, one of those reforms is to give some incentives to exploration companies that are coming on board. Um, one of the incentives being uh, uh, the rebate on equipment for capital projects like uh, drawings, tracks, and so forth. Uh, the important free of children. And also, the country is moving, I mean, a way to attract uh, investors for exploration. When investors come for exploration, what they just do is they explore and give the data to the government, right? So that when the government uh, is negotiating with the investor, they negotiate for something that they know. Of late, uh, a lot of uh, governments have lost a lot, lot of resources was they'll be negotiating on something that they don't know. Only the investor will, will be having information of what, what is there. So it's important that maybe the government have uh, information, maybe lighter information of what uh, the resource they have. Then when the investor comes on board for doing exploration, then you do, I mean, uh, create an improvement on the resource to make it a proven resource that is available. So, uh, uh, in a way, again, to incentivize exploration, the government uh, uh, is given some tax holidays and some uh, uh, tax e e exemptions for a period of time. I mean, from exploration, maybe up to two years into production, so that the mining companies can, can, can recover from the cost. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Minister. I mentioned in my introduction uh, the importance of China in terms of our commodity cycle and, and also in terms of potential global risks. Uh, I also mentioned that Mike has just returned from uh, China in fact actually over the weekend. And, and Mike, could you share with our audience here some of your insights following that visit? Sure. So I visited, um, the purpose of the visit was to look at uh, particular equipment financing solutions and uh, uh, vendor financing solutions from China. So I went to Beijing, Shanghai, Shenyang, and the impression of China is, uh, first of all, it's massive. I'm in awe of it. This was my second visit. These cities, uh, the first two each have about 20 million people in them individually. It's 1.2 billion people. And I was impressed how China has teamed up, uh, has modernized, and um, it looks as if the place has been fully constructed. So it's all, in, in my opinion, in China, the majority is about sustainability now. It's about um, electric vehicles, it's about uh, clean coal, it's about uh, EV metals, it's about uh, agricultural minerals that can be used in agriculture, such as phosphates. And one of the um, Financing solutions that we we've, uh, have come uh, across in China and are working now with is um, in financing for mining teams. So that would be a team of uh, articulated dump trucks or large rigids together with excavators, fully financed off balance sheet for mining companies and mining projects in Africa. Uh, so uh, these kind of financing solutions we've We've, uh, we are working with in China and they are fully supported and the, the quantums of capital available are, are huge. What has to work is the business case. So uh, that's my impression. Um, these are the, me the metals to focus on in the future. It's about sustainability, it's about metals for the new economy. Thank you very much, Dean. Mike, can I throw uh, the questions open to the floor? Uh, I'll take three, then I'll divert them to the panel. If you could just put up your hand, please. Uh, say who you are and from which company. The gentleman here on the right. Uh, any other questions? Uh, can you, Tony, can you put your hand up again, please? 
Here you go, thank you. Um, guys, we all need money. <laughs> Another <laughs> question there. Uh, a third one, please, before we uh, take the first. And there's a gentleman here in the front as well. Okay, thank you, Tony. Um, we were talking about uh, investment by uh, government. Uh, in South Africa, and I know in Zimbabwe, uh, they have uh, the Industrial Development Corporation, which actually provides debt and equity to various projects in the country. Um, how do you see the success of these organisations? Because it's a way of taking equity in projects and investing in debt. And, and uh, do you see it as a model for extending it to the rest of Africa? Thank you, Tony. Uh, there's a gentleman here, and there was another one to your right there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm from McKinsey and Company. My question is from Dr. Mike. Uh, you uh, explained a couple of uh, recent case examples on the transactions. I would like to understand a little bit more about the core transaction that you've talked about, given the uh, I mean, recent uh, sentiments on the core transaction is not that great. What made that specific project as a liquidity for the investment? I mean, something you can share about. So, did you say the name of the transaction again? Uh, the coal, coal one. Coal. Okay. Coal. 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 Okay. Thank you. Uh, and the third question was a gentleman here at the front. Yeah. Uh, so, our honorary minister from Uganda comes from Uganda. I'm a technical officer with the minister here. Mine is a compliment on from the risking projects through government. And I wanted to give a few examples in Uganda where government has tried to reduce the expression of risk in projects and have registered successful stories. One of them is in oil and gas. Government invested so much in exploration by investing itself in a pilot day. Uh, uh, fiscal data, and in our drilling time, the success rate was 80 percent. And in most countries, people invest and they use the money because of lack of success. So, government took an effort putting more money in oil exploration and building capacity. Our success rate was over 80 percent in all the drilling of the world. Another one is in geothermal. You know, in South Africa, we have geothermal. Kenya has been successful. But the Western Rift has not been successful. We are using the same model to reduce expression risk. We have now developed conceptual models as government. Now we are moving towards the grid. Because Rwanda rushed to move very fast, but they did not succeed. And that it became a disincentive to run projects if you are investing in the town. Another one is in mineral exploration. In mineral exploration, we have been able to interpret our airborne geophysical data. And we've been able to identify good targets, which are now ready for investors to take up and focus on those areas. And those studies have attracted more people now are looking at cobalt, uh, base metals, and have discovered more minerals than ever before. But we've already been able to confirm the rare earth elements, and this is where government risks the project by putting its own money, supporting itself, interpreting its own data, and when it gets good news, it also calls private sector to them up. Another one now is iron ore. We have more iron ore results now, but now we're working on the actual inputs, which are looking to do with coal and gas to refine it. And we're working now with the Tanzanian government on partnership, because they produce gas so that we can export, import gas from Tanzania, and then we're going to refine the, the iron ore to make steel. So these are a confirmation of how you do risk projects through political intervention by governments. And also government can support the private sector to take a key role in the cushioning the projects. So this is a complementary confirmation. As through my minister, of course, is, is here. My technical officer will also complement. But these are the words from us as Ugandan participants to confirm to the African Mining Summit that we are doing this effort to ensure that we reduce the risks at the company level so that we make conducive environment for investors. Thank you very much.
Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll interpret that. I've got a question that comes after that. So we have three questions and we have three members of the panel. Obviously, my, the question on coal is I aimed at you, so I'll leave that one for you. Uh, the question I'm going to take from the gentleman here, and, and clearly from uh, Uganda has been enormously successful, is there obviously the government is obviously funding uh, a lot of geophysical and other exploration work uh, to incentivize exploration companies to come into that particular country. Uh, is your government considering that, uh, is the question. And then Aleva King, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to give you the question about the Industrial Development Corporation. Has it been successful? And if it hasn't, what do they need to do? So Mike, uh, you start. Good, I'll start with the coal. Uh, the coal, um, there is money for coal projects. You have to find out where it is. And I, uh, if you unpack the business case from the coal seam to the market, the market, at the moment the money for coal sits in the market. So there's a lot of money in the market with the, the marketeers and the buyers of coal. And there's a lot of money with the contractors and the equipment suppliers for coal, for coal project, uh, that, that are being used in coal projects. There's very little money with the banks. The banks have quasi pulled out of coal. There's, in fact, there uh, has been an article recently, there's a, a, I think it's a one trillion pull out of coal investments globally. And that's from the banks. So to finance uh, coal projects and those that we are involved in, we look at particularly these pots of money, where are they? Many partnerships with the off-takers. The off-taker locks, locks themselves into the long-term coal supply. Two, uh, it's private funds where we offer an attractive return uh, by, by, uh, with our project, a guaranteed return over a period. And um, as well as contractors, there are contractors that, that have overcast and underground mining equipment. They need these to work. They're contractors themselves, equipment suppliers and contractors with cash. And these are sources of finance and these are the pots of money that we've been using in coal. Thank you very much, my Honourable Minister, uh, is, is the government and, and your equivalent to the Geological Survey uh, looking at providing this kind of level of information to investors uh, to incentivize them to come to uh, Zimbabwe? Uh, yes, Chair. Uh, we have already started uh, the process and uh, we've come up with uh, several ways of um, making sure that our geological information is accessible and also for any young investor so as to come into exploration, I will incentivize in that you can. That's wonderful. Uh, and Aleva uh, King, uh, IDC, does it work or does it not? And if not, what needs to be done? Um, all the DFIs in South Africa are mandated to invest in mining projects. I think that the issue for consideration is where they are told to invest. Most of them are prohibited from investing before feasibility, and that's where the money is needed. That exploration funding is absolutely critical to growing the South African mineral economy, but unfortunately, none of the DFIs actually put money in at exploration level. The IDC stepped out of its box, I think about a year ago, and said, we'll see them perhaps when the resources indicated, and we'll see how that goes. But that didn't go very well, because Unfortunately, when you've got too little money to invest in a sector that's high risk, um, it, it, the, the model is going to collapse in on itself. So I think for me, the DFIs have tried very hard to invest robustly in mining projects. They do invest quite a bit in mining projects, but only after feasibility. And unfortunately, most of the money is required before feasibility, where most people are finding it very difficult to raise the funding. So I think in the case of South Africa, I would perhaps want to say to the IDC, perhaps extend your mandate into exploration funding, which is, which is high risk, but I mean, it's, it's, it's required and it's necessary. And I said this, that South Africa has a very inappropriate risk appetite for the type of mineralization that it has. You need to have the risk appetite to match your mineralization. And if you're unable to finance your own mining projects, from exploration, find the money and make sure that that money goes in towards those projects. We have the IDC, the NEF, uh, uh, you know, several other CFA, CEDA, 
all these different development finance institutions that are mandated to invest in mining because mining is a huge part of our economy, but unfortunately, they're not investing at the right time in the mining cycle. Well, look, okay, thank you very much. Uh, we've now kind of run out of time. You know, this subject could occupy uh, a whole conference. Uh, I hope you've been able to gather some kind of words of wisdom uh, from our, our learned panel. And please give them a, a big round of applause. You're free to go. Just this stage.